Uh, this topic is uh, very closely related to uh, the topic of yesterday, the origin of man, but uh, more closely related to the topic with which I hope to deal on Monday, namely man in the image of God. So the aspect of man's nature with which I am going to deal in this lecture is what we might call the metaphysical. That is to say, I am trying to focus attention upon the component elements of man's nature, metaphysically considered. And uh, I am not dealing so much today with what properly comes under man in the image of God. Now we found out yesterday from our study of the origin of man that from the outset there is a material aspect to man's constitution. Man is bodily and therefore the scriptural way of expressing that truth is not that man has a body, but that man is body. And with that aspect of man's nature, I'm going to deal first of all. Man as body, or man is body. Scripture does not represent the soul or spirit of man as created first, and then put into a body. The opposite is the case. The body is not an appendage. And uh, therefore, the notion that the body is the prison house of the soul and that the soul is incarcerated in a body is pagan in its origin, is platonic, and has no resemblance to the biblical conception. For the Bible throughout represents the dissolution of the body and the separation of body and spirit as an evil, as the retribution and wages of sin, and therefore as a disruption of that integrity which God established at creation, when the Lord God formed the man dust from the ground and breathed in his nostrils breath of life, and man became living creature. Now there are certain corollaries that we may mention in connection with this proposition that man is body. First, the body is intrinsically good. It is not the source of sin, nor is it inherently degrading. No dishonor belongs to man because of the material aspect of his person. The body can become the avenue of solicitation to sin, but sin had its origin and it has its genesis still in the spirit of man. Of course, if you will, you can speak of it as the heart of man, but speaking a little more metaphysically, I like to use the word spirit in this connection. The dignity of the body is advertised by the fact that of man made in the image of God we read, and the Lord God formed the man dust from the ground. Then second, Man is not naturally mortal. Death is not the debt of nature, as you find in a great deal of Roman Catholic theology. Death is not the debt of nature. It is the debt of what violated man's nature, namely sin. And then third, body and spirit are not antithetical. They are diverse in metaphysical constitution. But there is no native or necessary conflict. And again, you see how alien 
traditional Roman Catholic theology is to this biblical conception. For traditional Roman Catholic theology, at least traditional Roman Catholic anthropology, is based on the assumption of the inherent conflict between body and spirit. The biblical concept is that in unity and concord, the two elements, body and spirit, constitute the unique personality that man is made in the image of God. Genesis 3.19, which you remember reads, Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return, in no way contradicts these corollaries. These words occur in the curse upon Adam because of sin, and they have relevance only in that context. The meaning is, that is of Genesis 3.19, the meaning is that the penalty takes this way of executing itself In the case of man, death addresses itself to his personality and takes account of the unique composition of his personality, hence his return to dust. If he were not dust, if he were not made of the material stuff of which this world is made, he could not return to dust. But... The reason for return to dust is not that he is dust, but that he has sinned. Now, in this insistence upon the intrinsic goodness of body, we need not maintain that the body as created was endowed with all the qualities with which it would subsequently be equipped if Adam had been confirmed in integrity and blessedness. It is one thing to say that no evil resided in or necessarily proceeded from the body. It is another thing to say that additional qualities of excellence could have been or would have been imparted to man in respect of his body if he had been confirmed in holiness. Inherent goodness is quite compatible with development and enrichment. The case is parallel to that which applies in general. Man was created in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, but confirmation of these is a much higher state of blessedness. Confirmation adds to what is good. It does not presuppose evil, the opposite of good. And as that is true in the realm of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, we can also apply that very same idea of enrichment or development to the body as well as to the human spirit. Now what is very important to uh, appreciate in this connection uh, is uh, the uh, theological or at least the anthropological significance of this doctrine of man as body. And I speak of them as the implications of the doctrine. The implications of this doctrine that man is natively, intrinsically, body. And first of all, there are the implications for sin. The body is not the seat of sin, but nevertheless the body becomes depraved. It becomes the agent of sin and its members instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. The body, because of sin, is a sinful body. Paul calls it the body of sin, Romans 6.6. 6. Now we are far re- too ready to underestimate the gravity of the sensuous manifestations of sin. That tendency is frequently bound up 
with the notion that the body does not belong to the integrity of personality and is something alien to it, incompatible with the highest attainments of spirituality. And so, on that assumption, sensuous lust is shrugged off as something that belongs to what is not intrinsic to our true nature, since man is body. It is necessary to remember that he is, as respects responsibility and guilt, as closely identified with the depravity of the body as he is with that of his spirit. And it is a matter of uh, profound practical significance for our sanctification to realize that uh, the sensuous manifestations of sin are exceedingly grave. And we are not to shrug off these sensuous manifestations simply because they are sensuous. Now, second, uh, the implications for death itself. Even the death even in death, the body that is laid in the tomb is not simply a body. It is the body of the person. And more properly speaking, it is the person as respects the body. It is the person who is buried or laid in the tomb. And the usage of scripture is very eloquent to that effect. Remember, respecting our Lord himself, Paul says, he was buried, he rose from the dead. In reference to, the, to, the, to Jesus, the angel said to the women after Jesus' resurrection, come see the place where he lay. Or if you prefer the text, come see the place where the Lord lay. Jesus also himself said, all that are in the graves will hear his voice. To Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And you see how significant that mode of expression is. Believers are dead in Christ. They sleep through Jesus. So what is laid in the grave is still integral to the person who died. In and during death. The person is identified with the dissolved material entity. And this underlies the gravity of death and the return to dust. But again, I would remind you of the terms of Genesis 3.19. To dust thou shalt return. It is not that there is dust, but to dust thou shalt return because dust thou art. And take full account of the significance of the, of the mode of expression. Then the third, the significance of this uh, aspect of human nature, of uh, the human identity, for the incarnation of our Lord. Our Lord's human nature was body and spirit. His body was composed of the same material elements which characterize other human beings. And since he took human nature into his person, he was human and therefore he was body and spirit. The mode of his incarnation was of course supernatural. He was begotten by the Holy Spirit. But his incarnation was not superhuman or superphysical. He was made of a woman, made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And it is interesting to notice how the Apostle John is combating, combating any form of Gnosticism or Docetism in this connection. When John wrote these words, in this ye know the Spirit of God, Every spirit that confesseth Jesus Christ come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God. First John 4, 2 and 3. Now the import of that is 
that the name Jesus is so bound up with the manifestation in the flesh that the confession of Jesus is confession of his bodily, fleshly identity. Now, as I said, it was some form of docetism that John was combating at that time. But you see, in that particular context, the test of orthodoxy was the confession of Jesus as bodily, the confession of his fleshly identity, and consequently to deny the reality of the flesh of Jesus both prior to and after the resurrection, is to overthrow the faith of Jesus. Every spirit that confesses not Jesus come in the flesh is not of God. Now the bias at work in what John was indicting on this occasion as Antichrist, 1 John 4, 3 and B, was, of course, Gnostic in its, uh, in its uh, premises and associated with the doctrine that material substance is inherently evil. The pattern of, this pattern of thought appears in various forms and it is a, it is a kindred bias that manifests itself in indifference to physical fact and experience, an attitude that is totally alien to the Christian faith. I say it is this very same bias of indifference to what is uh, sensuous, to what is physical, to what is bodily, that manifests itself in indifference to physical fact and experience. The Christian faith has profound concern for facts that transpired in the realm of the phenomenal, the historical, in the realm of sensuous fact, of physical experience. You might, if you wish, call it crassly physical experience. No New Testament writer is more jealous for the transcendent and superhistorical aspects of our Lord's person than is the Apostle John. You remember how he places that in the forefront of his gospel and of his first epistle. First John 1 1, you know, but John 1 1 and first John 1 2. But it is John who insists that the revelation of the eternal word and of the eternal life who was with the Father is given through sense experience. It is that insistence we encounter at the outset in his first epistle. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And then, lest we should miss that emphasis, he reiterates, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. And here you see there is the twofold insistence. First, the reality of the physical manifestation of the eternal life who was with the Father. And second, the insistence that through the medium of sensuous contact with him, in seeing, hearing, and handling, they, the witnesses, the disciples, entered into the fellowship of the living God, into the fellowship of the Father, of whom John affirms in his own gospel, no man hath seen God at any time. You see... How important is all of this that falls into the realm of sensuous, phenomenal experience in the Christian faith. Now it is true that living faith required more than the sense experience. The inward illumination was necessary to the perception of the meaning of the experiences 
to which John appeals. The experience is registered through the senses, but the point is that the inward illumination was directed to the interpretation of the sensuous manifestation and had no relevance apart from what transpired in the realm of sense, in the realm of the physical, in the realm of the sensuous. Of course, it is also true that we today do not have these same sense experiences. But our faith today and the fellowship resulting the fellowship of the Father and of the Son rest indispensably upon the witness of those who did see and hear and handle. And the only difference is that our faith rests upon accredited testimony with reference to this sensuous experience, while the faith of the apostles was elicited by direct experience of the same manifestation. And John advises us of that again in 1 John 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And so the highest reaches of true spirituality are dependent upon events that occurred in the realm of the physical and sensuous. A religion that can be indifferent to the bodily, to the physical, to the phenomenal, has no affinity with the Christian faith. And it is a spurious religiosity that does not warrant the name spirituality. You know perfectly well how widespread today is the denial of that which I am now insisting upon, the indispensability of the historical, what is concrete and historical in the realm of sensuous experience. And it is just precisely that that is, to a very large extent, denied or abandoned or underestimated in a great deal of the theology of our day. We can see, therefore, how unintimately bound up with the first principles of our holy faith is the doctrine that man is body, for only then can the redemptive revelation given in and through the man, Christ Jesus, become actual. Now, for fourthly, in the fourth place, the significance of this for the doctrine of the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ, first of all, and the resurrection of believers also. The resurrection, without the empty tomb and the living again of Jesus' dead and buried body, there was no resurrection. To deny the physical character of the resurrection is to deny the resurrection itself. And in respect of identity and continuity, it is all important to believe that our Lord has in heaven the same body that suffered on the cross, was laid in the tomb, and lived again on the third day. The resurrection thus conceived provides the pattern for the resurrection of believers. And the glory that will be bestowed at the resurrection will consist to a large extent in what could only be true in the realm of sense experience. Christ will then be manifested in the body of his glory. He will be seen the second time, and that emphasis upon his being seen is profoundly significant. It assures us that the physical occupies a central place in the consummation of salvation. 
in the attainment of the glory that awaits the people of God means that all the demands of the physical will be fully realized and satisfied in the vision of Christ's manifested glory. Here is exemplified and vindicated the significance of the body in that which is the pole star of the believer's hope, the appearing again of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the manifestation of the glory of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And of this we have the most eloquent corroboration in the believers groaning and longing. We ourselves also, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, we ourselves also groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. What? The redemption of our body. Romans 8, 23. In the same thought you have in Second Corinthians five two through four, and Philippians three twenty one. Now again, fifthly, as a theological implication, this doctrine of the body is altogether significant for the judgment, the final judgment, because. We are to be judged according to the things which we have done through the body. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Embodied life is the criterion of judgment and destiny. That indicates that no reversal of state and condition takes place in the disembodied period. Hebrews 9.27 is in its own way eloquent of the fact that there is a finality to death as death just as there is a finality to judgment as judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this judgment. Death and judgment are brought into conjunction as if they were in immediate sequence. Oh, the implication is that the intermediate state or the disembodied state falls into the shadow and has no determinative character for the judgment to be executed in the last day. Well, that's all I'm going to say about this aspect of human personality, that he is body. Now, second, we have the second aspect of his nature metaphysically considered that he is spirit or soul and I think it is just as necessary to say this in a propositional form as it is to say that man is body man is body is important in itself but it is not the whole definition Now, as we just found, even in death, the person is identified with the corpse that is laid in the tomb. The relation to the physical is not dissolved, even in death. But if the person is identified with what is lifeless, so that it can be said he is being buried or he has been buried, he is dead. There must be another aspect to the person not subject to the kind of disease that befalls the body. In other words, there must be an entity on the basis of which personality survives. The scripture provides us with copious evidence to establish the thesis that there belongs to man a subsistence or entity distinguished from the body 
and characterized by qualities in virtue of which it does not undergo the dissolution that befalls the body in death. Now, the scripture designates that as spirit or soul. Personally, I much prefer the word spirit. It is, I think, far more uh, biblical if you are making simply one proposition to use the word spirit than it is to use the word soul because even in scripture there is a much greater ambiguity attaching to the word soul than there is with respect to the word spirit when applied to man. I'm not talking about the various applications of the word spirit to God, uh, to angels, to demons, and to man. But when we are thinking of man, there is a, a certain uh, diversity of application of the word soul that is not so apparent in the use of the word spirit. But in any case, we can say that the scripture designates this spirit or soul. Now, I am very well aware that uh, due to uh, various influences, it, um, there is a certain um, type of uh, reaction, even in evangelical circles and uh, reformed circles, against uh, the, uh, the uh, notion of uh, man as having soul or spirit. But I just want to cite some of the biblical evidence. Because what we are interested in, I presume, is uh, what uh, the biblical teaching on this subject is. And I'm going to appeal to biblical evidence, beginning with that of our Lord himself. For example, in Matthew 10:28, our Lord said, Fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna, in hell. Now it is obvious that soul, suke, is used here in a metaphysical sense. Our Lord is basing his exhortation and consolation upon the differentiating properties and relationships of the two entities which he himself denominates body and soul. The soul is not subject to the destructive assault that may be brought to bear upon the body. Now in this case, uh, soul does not mean life constituted in a body, for when used in that sense, it can be spoken of as laid down, as killed, as destroyed. And I don't want, I don't want to uh, wait to give the evidence. It can be spoken of as sought after, to be taken away. But in Matthew 10, 28, you see, the soul is construed as untouchable in contrast with the body. So you see, you have a specific use of the word soul there in the very teaching of our Lord himself, who knew what was in man, whereby the differentiating constituents of the human person are designated body and soul. Again, in Matthew twenty-four forty-one. Our Lord said to the disciples in Gethsemane, The spirit truly is willing, but the flesh is weak. Here there is contrast, of course, between flesh and spirit. Now when flesh is used in the ethical sense, as frequently in the New Testament, it includes the spirit of man as well as the body. It is the whole personality who is called flesh. For example, when Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, 
It's the whole personality indwelt and controlled by sin, including, of course, the spirit as well as the body. But in this instance, in Jesus' word to the disciples in Gethsemane, the spirit is excluded from the flesh as wheat. So in this word of Jesus, there is more, I think, of extenuation than of reproach. I think it is frequently interpreted as uh, in terms very largely of reproof. I believe there is reproof in it because of the context. Could ye not watch with me one hour? But I think in this particular instance there is more of extenuation than there is of reproof. Although flesh may not be taken as synonymous with body, yet there is reflection upon the weakness associated with the physical in contrast with the willingness of the spirit as non-physical. So again, by implication, you have the differentiation, and in this case, differentiation in terms of the words flesh and spirit, just as in Matthew 10, 28, of body and soul. That is also the word of our Lord to his disciples. A spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me having. Now, he's not referring simply or exclusively to the spirit of man or the disembodied spirit of man, but nevertheless, there is here again the differentiation in respect of metaphysical quality. A spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me having. In 1 Corinthians 2.11, Paul says, Who of men knows the things of the man, save the spirit of the man which is in him? There are two observations. First, there is in man what is called spirit, pneuma. And second, of the spirit is predicated knowledge, that is, intelligent apprehension, inaccessible to any other man. Again, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 34, we read of the unmarried woman and virgin. And Paul says that she cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in the body and the spirit. And that is intended to express sanctification of the whole person and is therefore an inclusive designation. But nevertheless, the distinction between body and spirit is implied in the very terms. Or Paul says, both in the body and the spirit. Sanctification, again, is defined in its negative aspect as cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And again, the inclusiveness is apparent, but the distinction is implied and comes close to, if it is not identical with that of body and spirit, in the preceding reference. The distinction between the bodily and the psychical in human personality is also clear in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. May your spirit and soul and body be kept entire. And uh, there, are, there are various other references uh, to which I might appeal along that very same line. Now, Scripture calls disembodied persons spirits, and it portrays the disembodied state as one of consciousness and awareness of personal identity. When Paul says, we are of good courage and are willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and says that he had the desire to depart and to be with Christ, for it is far better, what he desired is inconceivable apart from the retention of personal identity. The intelligent exercise of the functions of personality and communion with the Savior and the fullest exercise of these attributes. Now, it is on the basis of these biblical data that we must conclude that man is spirit or soul as well as body. That is, there is an aspect to his person distinct from the body, and there belongs to his identity as man, an entity 
meant metaphysically differentiated from the body and endowed with properties and qualities in virtue of which it is not subject to the dissolution which the body undergoes at death. This entity, distinct from the body, retains its identity and differentiating character after death. More properly speaking, in virtue of spirit, the person retains his identity and continues to exist and be active in a realm and mode of existence, existence consonant with and adapted to the disembodied state. The highest exercises of man as a rational, moral, religious being are predicable of man by reason of that aspect. All that we are most characteristically as beings created in the image of God has its seat, unity, and abiding meaning in this entity. There is, in other words, an ego, spiritual in nature, indivisible and indestructible, continuously subsistent and active through all the changes of life in this world, in the disembodied state, and in the resurrected life in the age to come. We must not suppose, however, that the word soul, as it occurs in Scripture, always refers to this distinct and differentiated aspect of human personality. Well, I, pardon me, I must say that again. It's negative, but it's important. We must not suppose, however, that the term soul, nephesh in Hebrew, suke in Greek, <coughs> as it occurs in Scripture, always refers to this distinct and differentiated aspect of human personality. Soul, as I suggested a little ago, has various applications, even when used of man. In numerous cases, it refers simply to life, if you will, the principle of life, life constituted in the body. Soul is frequently the synonym of person and can stand for the personal pronoun. A lot of exegesis is... Uh, off the mark by failure to take account of that. Very frequently in the Old Testament, the word for soul is the synonym for the personal pronoun. And very fre frequently it is used uh, uh, reflexively. And uh, the Old Testament usage comes over into the New Testament. And uh, you find it frequently the case that soul is the synonym of person and stands for the, per for the personal throne. You remember, of course, about 3,000 souls being converted on the day of Pentecost. There's no reference to the disembodied entity. To that differentiating entity, it simply means 3,000 persons. And when Paul says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, uh, he's not talking of the soul as a differentiated entity in man, as if only their souls were to be subject, but not their bodies. No, you have to recognize that uh, the word has a great variety of application. And the thesis I am presenting now, insofar as it has reference to the term soul, is simply that with sufficient frequency, soul as spirit is used to designate the distinguishing component in the human person. A distinguishing component in the human person that is distinguished by its own differentiating properties and qualities. So now, a word of conclusion. 
The biblical doctrine is then to the effect that there are two aspects to man. And if we use the word entity to denote that which has distinctness of being, we can say that there are two entities in man's constitution. Diverse in nature and origin, the one derived from the earth, material, corporeal, phenomenal, divisible, the other derived from a distinct action of God, immaterial and ordinarily not phenomenal, indivisible and indestructible. These two entities form one organic unit without disharmony or conflict. In the integral person, they are interdependent. They coact and interact. The modes of coaction and interaction are largely hid from us. In other words, the union is intimate and intricate, and we are not able to define its mode, nor can we discover the relations they sustain to each other. The union of soul and body which makes man, in Macpherson's words, is not external and extensive, but internal and intensive. I would also quote with approval the words of Hermann Duiverd from his new critique of theoretical thought, the English translation, volume 3, page 89. The human body is man himself in the structural whole of his temporal appearance. And the human soul, in the pregnant religious sense, is man himself in the radical unity of his spiritual existence which transcends all temporal structures. Now, in that definition, I would say that temporal appearance is a little too restrictive. The human body is man himself in the structural whole of his temporal appearance. I would reserve that I would question the legitimacy of that restriction because it does not do justice to the permanence of the body in the integrity of human life. But with the main thought of this particular statement from Duyeverd, I am in thorough agreement that the human body and the human soul are man himself, and not simply man in, uh, in what you would call discrete uh, separable aspects. So, to conclude, the inference would have to be that the spirit or soul is the substrate, center, and seat of human personality. The unique identity of man is that he is a psychosomatic being with the most intimate correlation, coordination, and integration of constituent elements, so that he is equipped to exercise the dominion with which he has been invested. The duality belonging to man's being provides the basis for the duality of, relation, of relationship, relationship to what is above and to what is below. It is, however, in the unity and integrity of his being that he sustains these relationships. All important, it is in the unity and integrity of his being that he sustains these relationships, all his relationships. As body alone, he could not exercise dominion, and it is in his totality that he owes subjection to God. The components of his being may never be viewed, therefore, in abstraction. It is a psychosomatic being. He is made in the image of God. And as such, he sustains and exercises all his relationships. Thank you very much. That is all on this subject.